Hello, everyone. I'm Zhao Chuan. Let's meet Frederick the Loki Ceratops. Loki Ceratops is a peculiar Ceratopsian dinosaur newly named in 2024. This dinosaur has an unusual appearance, and its fossils are quite valuable. We are very grateful to Dr. Mark Lowen, the lead researcher of this dinosaur, for providing a lot of information that helped us restore and create this animal. Overall, this dinosaur is a sturdy ceratopsian, exhibiting the typical features of this group. It belongs to the subfamily Centrosaurini. They roamed on Earth about 78 million years ago, on a vast island landmass isolated by a seaway. This dinosaur had a massive body, and, before the emergence of Triceratops, might have been one of the largest ceratopsians, reaching a body length of 6.7 meters. Its enormous head accounted for nearly one-third of its total length. Its skull was almost two meters high and about one meter wide, with a weird appearance. Most of the remains are of the skull. The pelvis, the most complete part of the postcranial skeleton, and some scattered vertebrae and limb bones have also been discovered. Now, let's examine this dinosaur from its head. This dinosaur got its name because of its distinctive head. Its full scientific name is Lochiceratops rangiformis. The specific name rangiformis refers to its resemblance to a rangifer, commonly known as a caribou, both with bilaterally asymmetrical horns on their heads. Loki in the generic name is a pun. First, it was chosen in reference to the similarity between its frill horns and the two horns associated with Loki, the trickster god in Norse mythology, who also carried double blades as his weapon. It pays tribute to such imagery. In addition, its fossils were unearthed from a quarry named Loki, making the name fitting. The most striking feature of its head is the two immense structures, which are frill horns. Many ceratopsians, especially centrosaurines, possessed such structures. For example, the familiar Styracosaurus boasted six very long frill horns. Loki ceratops had four eye-catching horns on the top of its frill. The two in the midmost were a pair of asymmetrical, small spikes. The two outer horns next to them were broad, laterally curved, blade-like structures, indicating they likely served a display purpose. Their shape and blunt tips suggest they weren't for defense. When we designed the color scheme, we made this part conspicuous with bright yellow. Over the years, there have been some very intriguing studies on the frill horns of ceratopsians. Let's briefly discuss this together with the skull of this dinosaur. First, this type of horn was covered with a layer of keratin when the dinosaur was alive, so the reconstructed appearance would be wider than the preserved horn core. The remains of this dinosaur already show that their size is considerable, like two large plates, but they appear even larger after being covered with keratin. These spikes and brow horns also look much longer than those found in the fossil. Then, let's look at the number of the marginal ossifications along the frill. When the fossils were unearthed, the parietal on this side was not well preserved, and part of it was missing. However, the preserved portion demonstrates a noticeable difference. The ossifications on the other side are much larger than those on this side. During discussions with the scientists about the restoration, they gave two suggestions. One is that there are undoubtedly eight ossifications on the intact side, while those on the other side are smaller in size and possibly greater in number, maybe nine. This means the ossifications on two sides are asymmetrical in number. Another view is that this side also has eight ossifications but in a slightly sparser arrangement. After discussing with the lead author, I chose the bilaterally symmetrical restoration, as it appears more visually appealing. Other studies have been conducted in recent years regarding the number and position of these ossifications in ceratopsians. When these dinosaurs were young, these structures were believed to be osteoderms derived from the epidermis. No matter how big and what forms these structures would develop into, when dinosaurs matured, they initially appeared as simple bumps or a series of small, blunt hornlets along the frill in their juvenile stage. 
As the dinosaurs grew, these structures, which were initially isolated in the epidermis, began to connect to the underlying bones, anchored, and eventually developed into various types of horns. Therefore, their final form depended on their point of attachment. For example, the two on this side developed into spikes as they positioned themselves here. If this part were injured, the lower one would shift up and become a spike. This would result in three relatively crowded spikes in this area. This is why many ceratopsians, especially low-key ceratops, display asymmetrical horns on both sides. Taking the two horns on this side as another example, they may have experienced growth injuries, causing them to be squeezed together into a larger structure, while the other two remained independent. This could represent an individual morphological difference. If another Loki ceratops was found, it might have a different structure on its head, possibly featuring a pair of symmetrical spikes in the middle. This is why the skull of this dinosaur looks so bizarre. That's all for this part. Let's move on and look at other details. Compared to other ceratopsians, its head frill extended vertically, like a chair backrest, which suggests that it was apparently for display purposes. We designed and restored two eye spots in this area on its frill, similar to those found on peacock tails. This dinosaur had two short brow horns. Although the remains display them as relatively short, they would appear longer with a keratin sheath. In a top-down view, you will notice that the two brow horns extend forward and laterally outward. It had a large, fairly thick nose but no nasal horn. And, it had a sharp beak. This is what its head looks like. We don't know much about the body of Loki Ceratops. The best preserved part of its postcranial skeleton is the pelvis. The holotype features a broad pelvis. From the fragmentary fossils, we can infer that its tail, like most centrosaurines, is not long. And its overall body shape is like this. It had the typical forelimbs and hindlimbs of ceratopsians. The forelimbs had five fingers, with the inner three used for walking while the other two remained off the ground. The hindlimbs had four toes, the inner toes were smaller, and it relied on the outer three to bear weight. Regarding its skin, unfortunately, no fossils have been found. However, Dr. Lowen, the paper's lead author, hoped this dinosaur could have delicate skin commonly in centrosaurines. So, we consulted the preserved skin of other centrosaurines for reference and restored its skin like this. The tiny scales on the abdomen are square, and those on the back are hexagonal or polygonal, with larger protrusions in between. Finally, let's discuss its coloration. The head is relatively bright, while the rest of the body is darker. You can see this from the restorations in the author's paper and other relevant news report. The author envisioned that its body would look darker, and the head might be greenish with reddish or yellowish horns to present a more eye-catching appearance. Good, the above concludes the creating story of Frederick the Loki Ceratops. Thank you all.